morning. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter two. <clears throat> We've been going through the book of Second Timothy on Sunday nights, and I thought we'd uh, move it to the to the morning today. And we've been looking at some of the pictures of the Christian life. And tonight we're, we're look, tonight, this morning, we're looking at the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. <clears throat> I've found that we like the idea of being a servant until someone treats us like a servant. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult passage to really take to heart, but it's true. It's true. We need to be the servant of the Lord. We've, we've looked at a lot of different pictures. Uh, verse 15 was the workman. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the thing we're working with, one of the things we're working with is the word of God. It's important for us as Christians to be workmen that use God's Word and apply it and, and use it in our own lives and in the lives of others. Uh, last week we looked at being a vessel. And uh, I, I said then, the main thing I know about a vessel, if I'm going to use a vessel, I want it to be clean. <laughs> uh, verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he should be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. You know, that's what God wants us to be, clean vessels. Uh, ready for his use. Let's read on there in verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God Peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. The servant of the Lord. He says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. And, you know, as you look at that and you think back to the beginning of the chapter, it, it almost seems at odds with the picture of being a soldier. <laughs> Verses 3 and 4, he, he, he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But remember, uh, this is not a physical warfare he's talking about. We don't take up physical weapons. In, in fact, he, he says that in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, verse 4. He says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You know, it's not physical weapons that we're, we're using, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. As well, the enemy is not physical. This is, this is hard to grasp. You know, sometimes you might think a person is your enemy. God says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The enemy is spiritual. And we're going to, he's mentioned already as we've read there in, in verse 26, uh, this is a fight of faith. 1 Timothy 6, 12, he said, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. One of my favorite verses, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's a fight of faith. And uh, the soldier, as he said there in verse 4, is to please him who hath chosen him. The servant is to please his master. Sounds very similar when you, when you really put it together like that, doesn't it? Uh, the soldier pleases his commander, the servant pleases his master. And that's what we're looking at this morning, the picture of, uh, as Christians, being a servant of the Lord. Now, the phrase there in, in verse 24 says, The servant of the Lord must not strive. Now, I know this is not the main emphasis of this, this verse, but I think it's right to apply it in this way. The servant of the Lord must not strive with his master. Now, that's not the main point he's getting across here. But as you look through the verses in the Bible on being a servant, uh, that's, that's one of the main things that, that comes up. You know, strangely enough, one of the main things a servant does is serve. <laughs> It's like the workman. He works. Well, a servant serves. And for a servant, obedience is expected. Uh, I just went through some of the verses that mention this word. And for instance, in Luke chapter 7, in verse 8, this was uh, uh, the centurion who was asking Jesus to heal uh, his servant. 
He said to him, I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers, and I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. Uh, interesting, he talks about the soldier. Then he says, And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. Now, he understood authority. He understood that the main, one of the main things a servant does is he obeys his master. Uh, that's, that's to be expected. A servant's job is to please his master. The same is true for a Christian. Our job is to please our master. You know, life can get kind of confusing if you, keep, if you don't keep that in mind. There's a lot of people telling you what to do. As you come down Trout's Road here, there's a sign. It annoys me every time I go by it. It says, slow down. I never speed around that corner. But it still stands there and, stands there and tells me, slow down. Come on. Yeah, there's a lot of people trying to tell you what to do, aren't they? In one way or another. You know the main one we need to listen to? You know the only one we really need to listen to? It's our master. It's the Lord. That's important to understand. In Galatians 1.10, he said, Do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. He's put it in a nutshell there, hasn't he? If we're going to be trying to please men, then we're not what we should be. The Bible says we're to be the servant of the Lord. And the servant of the Lord must not strive with his master. Service is normal. In Luke chapter 17, in verse 7, Luke chapter 17, verse 7 now, he talks about a servant. He says, Which of you having a servant plowing or, or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, Go and sit down to meat? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. He says, I, I don't think so. So likewise ye, when you've done all, the, the, all those things which are commanded, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. See, a servant isn't commended for doing his duty. That's what a servant is supposed to do. It, it, it would be unusual for a servant, a servant to go above and beyond the call of duty because they've got so much to do. <laughs> You know, we do one thing for the Lord, and we think, wow, wasn't that great? You know, I should get a pat in the back and an award and a doctorate and you know, all kinds of things. That's our duty. That's who we are. We're servants of the Lord. Right. It's not a problem to serve the Lord. It's a blessing. You know, one of the things that the disciples did is they took something that for many people would be a, a problem, and they made it a mark of honor. Over and over they say, the servant of the Lord. Paul, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of the Lord. What a blessing that we can call him our master. And it's not just doing that one or two things. It's doing what our master tells us to do. You see, a, a servant is expected to be faithful. Back in Matthew chapter 24... Matthew chapter 24... And part of being faithful is being ready... You know, the master at any moment should be able to say, come and do this or come and do that. And the servant should be ready. And he talks about this in Matthew 24, verse 44, when he's talking about coming again. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that ye shall, he shall make him ruler over all his goods. See, we need to be ready. We need to be faithful. Uh, not just thinking about serving the Lord, but ready to serve the Lord. Matthew 25, 21, he says, His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now that, that's, what we want, that's what we're looking for. And that's what we need to practice. You know, the, the, the other thing that came up as I looked at being a servant is being a servant makes us like Jesus. Do you ever think about that? In Matthew chapter 20, verse 27, this is a, a verse that 
a lot of leaders in the world should, should listen to. Matthew 20, 27, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. <clears throat> Jesus came to serve. And when we see ourselves as servants of the Lord, that's like Jesus. As we faithfully serve, there's a, a wonderful verse, a couple of verses in John chapter 15, where he, he talks about the faithful servant moves from not being just a servant, but to being a friend. You can kind of imagine that when you think about a servant-master relationship. But he, he says that's true in our relationship with the Lord as well. <clears throat> John chapter 15, verse 14, you are my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. <clears throat> but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father I've made known unto you. you know, as we're faithful and serve the Lord, uh, what an honor. You know, like I mentioned, the disciples claimed and honored the title servant of the Lord. <clears throat> In Acts 4 they, they said, Lord grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. We need to take uh, this picture and make it more than a picture. We need to make it reality, don't we? The servant of the Lord. It's an honor to be a servant of the Lord. <clears throat> well, back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, a couple of things that we can, we can take note of. In being a servant, God's servants need to keep clean. Uh, verse 22, as we read there in, in 2 Timothy 2, we talked about this last Sunday night, but we'll, I'll mention it again. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. God's servants need to keep clean. It's not right for us as God's servants to disobey God's word. Uh, he, he gives us the uh, command or the, the instruction, flee. Uh, we need to keep away from sin. And then he says, follow, and he lists all these things, righteousness, faith, charity, peace, uh, we need to follow what God has given to us. And he says we do it together with them that call on the Lord uh, out of a pure heart. Uh, keep yourself clean. Keep yourself uh, able to be used. Uh, you know, many of us in, in our past have things we've done that, that we're ashamed of. But God makes us clean. God makes us clean. None of us in our own right are, are right before God. It's only by justification being declared righteous. Now keep that in mind. The devil will remind you of your past. God will point you to the future. God, God deals with us now. God will, deals with us today. You know, I love 1 John uh, 1 verse 7 where he talks about our sins being forgiven because the, the words that he uses there are present continuous action when he says, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's not just in the past. That's now. That's now. That's now. As long as you want to say now, it's now. He keeps us clean by His blood. What a blessing uh, to know. God's servants are to keep themselves clean. Jesus cleanses us, and then we need to try and have our, our life match what Jesus has done. Secondly, in verse 23, God's servants are to avoid foolish and stupid questions. <laughs> That's exactly what he says there. Avo foolish and unlearned questions avoid. You know, King James is always really nice about things. Uh, unlearned questions, that just means stupid. <clears throat> Knowing that they do gender strife. Listen, you don't have to get into the media too long before you hear some pretty stupid questions. You don't have to go door knocking too long before you hear some stupid... I've I, I, I got to get off that. Uh, <laughs> We're his servants. We don't have to mess around. We, we just need to tell people the truth. We need to do it kindly and in love. It's an honor to be a servant of the Lord. And our goal is not to fight people. You know, when he talks about being a soldier for the Lord, we're not fighting people. Our job when we, when we talk about being servants is to rescue people for our master. That's what he wants to happen. He wants people to be rescued. And let me tell you, I've heard that sometimes uh, lifesavers will have to knock someone out to rescue them. I, mean, I don't know how you do that in the water, but anyway. Uh, you know, some people will fight you. <laughs> you, know, you can't go by what people are saying and doing. They still need rescuing. 
You know, they'll, they'll go like this. You know, Often times when I'm door knocking, I'll get people, oh, no, we're not interested. Well, I know you're not interested. That's why I'm here. <laughs> you know, we need to be careful. We're not there to fight people. And it's no good taking it personally. We're there to rescue people for our master. And he cares about them. He knows them. He knows their, their wicked heart, just like he knows your heart and my heart. And he loves them. And that, that brings us to verses to the last few verses there, but uh, let me say this. If he's your master, if you know the Lord Jesus as your savior, are you an obedient servant or are you fighting your master? Is it a constant conflict when he tells you something to do as to whether you'll, you'll do it or not? Uh, you know, as servants of the Lord, we must not strive with our master. That should not be a, the character of our life. But as well, and this is the main thrust of this passage, the servant of the Lord must not strive with those that his master calls him to reach. Uh, our job is not to fight with people. Uh, the servant of the Lord, and he gives quite a few characteristics there in verse 24 when he says that we, we must not strive. That means to, to fight. Or, he says, but we should be gentle. You know, that's the way Jesus was. Now, Jesus said strong things. Being gentle doesn't mean you don't do what's right, and it doesn't mean you don't say what's right. It just means that you don't have a mean attitude about it. And Jesus surely didn't. Uh, Jesus is love. And there's times when, boy, he rebuked people. You know, I go like that because I think he did too. You whited sepulchers. He did it because he loved them. He wanted them to see their hearts. And uh, you know, we need to, as Christians to be, to be gentle. You know, there's, there's no excuse for us to be unkind. Uh, the Bible says in, in Ephesians 4 and, and verse 32, Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, there's, we, we look at people and we want them to follow the Lord and so we, we're mean to them. How does that make any sense? The Bible says we need to be gentle. He says as well that we need to be apt to teach. Strangely enough, one of our jobs as servants is to teach people what the Bible says. We need, we need to be presenting the truth. And I've discovered this. this is, you need to write this down. You, you probably never heard this before. But to teach, first you have to learn. <laughs> first you've got to learn something before you can teach. I've, I've noticed over the years one of the best ways to learn is to, give, is to have a class that you've got to teach. <laughs> And boy, you get pretty, pretty earnest about it. You know, you try and learn something so you have something to, to teach. Um, there was a, a man in the Old Testament named uh, Ezra. And uh, God called him to, to lead the nation of Israel back, back, to, uh, back to Israel after they'd been taken captive. And uh, one of the things it says about him, it just made me think of him this morning. Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, it said... Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. See, his ability to lead Israel, his ability to teach Israel is because, first of all, he dealt with his own heart. First of all, he, he prepared his own heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. You know, as, as God's servants, we need to be gentle. We need to be apt to teach. That doesn't mean just frantically studying because you've got to do something. It means day by day, moment by moment, faithfully reading your Bible, thinking about it, memorizing it, meditating on it, so that God can change you and uh, he can use you to change others. He says as well that we need to be patient. Uh, we had news this week uh, of somebody we worked with many years ago, and uh, you know, they'd kind of gone, well, they had gone away from the Lord, and we heard, you know, they're, they're back following the Lord, as far as we know. Uh, you just don't know. It's not necessarily today or tomorrow or the, even this year. Sometimes it's, it's going to take a long time uh, to reach people. And we need to be faithful. We need to be patient. You know, if people are going to know what God has to say, uh, it needs to come from us. They need to hear the truth. Uh, there's people who's, who think that going to heaven depends on their works. And so, boy, they're out there working. You know, as Christians, because, oh, everything's just based on love, we, oh, I don't, I don't have to do that. <laughs> uh, we need to, to take seriously the, the things of the Lord. He tells us that people need the Lord. 
If there's going to be a revival, listen, it doesn't have to start with someone else. It needs to start with you. Just draw a circle and get in and say, Lord, start a revival in this circle. It's the same for me. I can't expect revival to start with someone else. I've got to prepare my heart to seek the Lord and, and to do it and so that God can, can use me. The servant of the Lord, he needs to be gentle. He needs to be apt to teach, patient. He needs to be meek, the Bible says. Now, unfortunately, that word has been misrepresented many times, and people take it as you know, a person who's weak. Meekness is strength under control. That's the only way you can use strength. I remember I had some really important jobs growing up, and one of them was a dishwasher. And uh, when I finished, I used to have to clean up with a steam hose. Let me tell you something. You don't want to let that steam hose get out of your hand. Uh, I discovered that. <laughs> uh, you know, power without control is, is a mess. It hurts people. And God wants his power and our power to be harnessed by his control. God can use you, but not if you're out of control. Uh, we need to have our strength under his control. That's being a servant, the servant of the Lord. And he talks then about those that we're ministering to. In verse 25, instructing, this, this phrase just always boggles my mind, instructing those that oppose themselves. In the, whole, the world, people without Christ are opposing themselves. You know, when Doyle mentioned that she, you know, door knocking yesterday, trying to give somebody a track, oh no, we're not interested. Isn't that strange? She's on their side, they're against themselves. They're saying, I'm, I'm working at going to hell. I want you to go to heaven. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And yet that's, that's the field that we're called to. We're trying to reach people who are opposing themselves. Listen, they need the truth. They, they need repentance, he says here. If God, peradventure, peradventure, God can give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. <clears throat> when our daughter was little, she used to, we sing a song from these verses. And she used to call it the adventure song. Well, let me tell you, you become a servant of the Lord, it'll be an adventure. You never know where the master is going to send you or who, who you're going to be uh, working with. But the people that God has before us need the truth. They need repentance. And repentance is just a change of mind. I mentioned this, I think, last, last Sunday night. You know, most of us think we're good. We do. If, everybody, if people really knew me, they'd like me. <laughs> Yeah, in one part of our mind, we think that. And then in the reality part of our mind, we, we know different. But, uh, yeah, we think, yeah, I ask people a lot. If you died today, would you go to heaven? Yeah, I would. I'm, I've been good. God says we need a change of mind. God says there's none good. He says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says we're like sheep without a shepherd. We're like the blind leading the blind. People need the Lord. And as Christians, we have what they need. God tells us that these are folks that are opposing themselves. And then he says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. They're, they're captives of the devil. You know, it's no wonder that when we try to witness to folks uh, that, that they resist. They're on, they're on the opposite team right now. You know, without Christ, uh, they're, they're not on God's side. They're not looking for the truth. They might say they are. And when people give you a hard time for being a witness, best you can, don't take it personally. Listen, it's like dealing with the mentally ill or, or with a person who's sick. You know, they have a, a disease. We have the cure. And that disease is making them bad. It's, it's hurting them. Don't take their opposition personally. You know, really, we're seeing two things here this morning. People are either a servant of the Lord or a captive of the devil. You need to ask yourself, where are you in that formula? Are you a servant of the Lord? Are you saved? Or are you still a captive of the devil? If you're saved today, you've been there. You know what that's like. Now, some of you got saved as children, and, you know, maybe you don't understand it as much as others, but, uh, you know, if you got saved... When you were a little older, you understand what it's like to be a captive of the devil. 
we should have sympathy for folks uh, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Turn with me if you would to Romans chapter 6 and let's just take a, a look there before we end this morning. He talks there about the difference between being a servant of righteousness or a servant of sin. There's a lot of material in the Bible about service. You can, you can do more research yourself, but Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, pretty much the whole chapter, but I won't read the whole chapter. Romans chapter 6, verse 17, he says, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. He's talking here to Christians. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. He's saying, this is a human picture because you're humans. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, so that's in the past, he says, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we often use that verse, but we don't often look at the context. He's talking about the difference between slavery to sin and slavery to righteousness to the Lord. And he says you can either get the wages you deserve or you can get the gift of God that you don't deserve. You know, without Christ, we're going to get the wages of sin. And that's death, separation from God for eternity. But Christ offers us forgiveness. He offers us a position. We can be his child. We can be his servant. What a blessing. And the difference is verse 17. You were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. See, it starts in the heart. We're all born servants of sin, but Christ offers us freedom. You know, what, a, what a blessing. Uh, in verse 23, when he, he says the wages of sin is death, uh, that's where we start. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And later on, Romans 10, 13, he says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. That's incredible, isn't it? That God would become a man, live and die for us, rise from the dead in, in victory over sin and death, and offer to us freely, at his cost, the gift of salvation. Man, if nothing else, that should cause us to love him enough to serve him. If that won't do it, I don't know what will. And yet we do resist him, don't we? Uh, I'm talking from personal experience here, I'm sorry to say. But let me encourage you, don't believe the devil's lies. He doesn't want you to get saved. He'll tell you you're good enough. God says all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There's a verse that many people know, John 3, 16. Not many people know John 3, 18. Right after 16, he says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Boy, people don't like that. Without Jesus, we're condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He's the Savior. He's the one we need. That's why he can say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, believe the Lord today. You know, it's a hard thing to come under condemnation. It's a hard thing. It, it makes us angry sometimes. But you know, if we'll believe the Lord, He offers us forgiveness and cleansing. His blood will cleanse us from all sin. If you are a Christian this morning, let me encourage you to serve the Lord. Take to heart uh, this teaching that we're to be the servants of God. He said, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. That's where we need to be. 
But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You know, this morning could be the beginning of a, of a wonderful relationship between you and the Lord. If you've, if you've never been saved, now I, I don't know hearts this morning, but if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, the Bible says now is the time. Today is the day. He died for your sins. He, he, he's the Savior. He's the only way. No one else can take you uh, to the Father, only through Jesus. And as Christians, uh, if we've experienced that, surely we can love Him and serve Him. What an honor to be called the servant of the Lord. But the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Now, that's the call of God for us today. Now, what about you? Snared by the devil or serving the Lord? Let's go to him in prayer with our heads bowed and in an attitude of prayer. Maybe the Lord is speaking to your heart. Maybe you've heard and understood for the first time this morning that you need to be saved. Today's the day. Maybe you're saved, but you've been resisting and, and striving with your master, and you need to repent. Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Lord, you know us, and, and still you love us. And Father, you've prepared a place for us, and you've done, uh, we know every good thing comes from you. Father, help us to love you in return. Help us to truly be your servants. We pray this in Jesus' name.